Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Elevate Your Equity podcast. We are so excited that you are here. And today we have an amazing guest. There is so much wisdom out of this podcast. We know that you're going to be getting some amazing nuggets of wisdom out of it. And we're excited that you're here. Our first guest is Mike Fritz. Mike Fritz is a national collegiate leadership speaker and author of five collegiate best-selling books. He spoke to over 25,000 students and faculty, giving them tools and strategies to take their leadership to the next level. Mike started investing in real estate 21 years ago when he built his first multifamily property with his own hands, true story. Since then, he and his wife, Leanne, have $2.4 million of personal real estate under their management. Mike has an unmatched passion for real estate because it provides him and his wife, Leanne, with the amazing opportunity to create generational wealth. And it's a great opportunity for their investors and give families more time together. Mike believes passive income through multifamily real estate investing provides the most powerful thing in the world, time and freedom. Mike's greatest passion is people. As a serial entrepreneur for most of his life, he sought to center his business around value that he could add to his clients and his partners. That's the energy and passion that started and turns TCI, Titanium Capital Investment Group. It was such an honor to have uh, Mike Fritz on. We actually are recording this after we had the interview and we are just jacked up right now. There is so much to take away from this interview and we know that you're going to be enjoying it as well. What did you take away from this that you want to share with the audience? Well, I was like, I was telling Mike, I actually got a little selfish and I just, I forgot that I was a host for a while and took notes and acted like it was like a self-help class for me. But what really stood out for me the most was we got a peek behind the curtain in terms of hearing about Mike's relationship with his wife, Leanne. And just the way he describes the synergy and their strength of their overall relationship really gave us an understanding of how he leveraged, how they both leveraged all of their things that they do together, like having retreats together in which you'll hear more, um, but how that it was all leveraged to help elevate their overall success in not only their marriage, but real estate investing and their lives as a whole. Yeah, fantastic. I think some other things too that our listeners can look forward to is Mike's journey and how he started literally building his own duplex from with his own bare hands from a very, very young age. And going from there all the way through the uh, residential property journey to getting into multifamily real estate and then providing some really practical tools for some people to start out with uh, and some things that you absolutely must do when you're starting, no matter what it is that you're getting into. And I'm not going to tell you what that is, but you'll have to listen in to find out. So thank you for tuning in, and we hope that you enjoy this very wide-ranging and very fascinating and insightful conversation with Mike Fritz. All right, and here we are. We have our guest, Mike Fritz. He's in the house. Hey, Mike, how you doing there? Hey, I'm doing fantastic. How are you both doing? We're doing great. We're doing doing great. good. It's great to have you on with us. Thank you so much. It's always it's always great to meet other amazing couples that are in the real estate game and doing great work like you are. So uh, I'm honored to be on your show. Thank you so much for having me. Well, fantastic. The honor is ours, man. Um, I've been following you over the last uh, six months to about a year since we've known each other, and you've got an impressive track record, my friend. So let's well, just jump. I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Let's just jump right in. So why don't you uh, take us on a journey of Mike Fritz? Who are you? What are you about? Where did you oh, come man. from? Well, there's 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 kind of two di- diverging stories. One is you know me, and the other is the real estate me, and they both kind of intertwine. But they all start in sixth grade when I went on my very first date. I asked this girl to recess, and uh, and she said yes. Um, she shouldn't have, but she said yes. And uh, uh, I went up, and this is the pickup line I used. I walked up to her and I just went, "Hey, I've noticed you," and it sounds real creepy. And she should have ran. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, she did decide to go on that date with me, and we went on. We went to recess, and it must have been the f- greatest first date ever because I've been married to that woman for 19 years, and so uh, she is. Uh, she's not only my best friend, but she's uh, she's a p- huge part of who I am and who I've been my entire. I've known her almost my entire life, and so uh, my wife is a huge part of me. And we uh, we got engaged young. We got out of high school, got engaged. We I just had turned 19. And I asked her to marry me. We got uh, we got married when we were 20, 
And uh, that was when my real estate career started. I actually kind of have this weird track record. All my mom's side owned rental property growing up. Mm. And so I watched like income property. But one of the cool things I saw was the house I grew up in, my, my parents bought when they, they were just married two years. And I was like six months, we moved into this little house, this, this house. But on the property was this tiny little like 300 and I think it was like 450 square foot one bedroom house that they rented out and was kind of a house hack. And so um, if you know that term, it's where you live in part and you can rent another part off and almost live for free. And so I actually grew up understanding that concept because I watched it firsthand. And so at 19 years old, when I asked my wife to marry me, my now wife to marry me, um, I asked my parents, I said, Hey, I was, a, I grew up in a family of builders. Everybody was builders. Everybody had their contractors license. So I grew up in the summers slinging hammers and building houses for my family. And so when I was 19, I started a construction business right when we got married. And, uh, and I, I asked my dad, I said, I have no credit and no money. Um, I do, I, I, you know, I, I even had to borrow the good looks. I didn't really have that either. And so I'm like, Hey, I need some help. Um, will you uh, help? So I went to my parents. I'm like, Hey, will you help me get my Leanne and I get a loan? My wife's name is Leanne. And I said, will you help us get a loan, a construction loan? And so they did. And I bought a little piece of property and we built a duplex. And right when we got married, we lived in half and rented the other half out. I built it on nights and weekends. So it was a grinding thing, nights and weekends when you're building a house from scratch and uh, built a duplex. And, uh, and uh, we lived in half in a brand new place for $100 a month when we got married. And, uh, and that, was my, that was my journey into real estate and of who I am. So I started as a builder. And then age 24, I took an interesting turn. I sold my construction business. And uh, by the way, that duplex we built, we built for $129,000 and 19 months later, sold it for $184,000. That's big um, money for a young, a young kid yeah, like exactly. that. exactly. And I put all that money uh, at age 24. I decided to go to college and step foot on a college campus for the very first time. And so I went to college at age 25. I've never been on a college campus. Uh, I, I never went to college until age 25. And then I went to be a minister and I went to undergraduate and graduate school. And so I got my master's, my, my bachelor's master's degree by the time I was 30 and uh, which the master's degree I went into was not uh, most master's degree. If you know anything about education, it's anywhere 30 to 40 credits. My master's degree was 96. And so um, it was basically three master's degrees tied into one giant program. So it was a lot of school. Uh, I, 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 I was the kind of, st- so people think, you know, man, you, you guys in real estate, you must need to be really smart. I graduated high school with a 1.9 GPA. <laughs> and, and so when people, when people think that I graduated high school with a 1.9 GPA and never, I, I didn't read my first book until I was 23 years old. Mm-hmm. And so when people think that it's, it's something you're born with, it's not, it's truly something you build with, uh, with, with, you know, whatever gifts you've been given. And so, um, and so I, but I, you know, and so I went, I stepped foot on a college campus. I'd never gotten good grades. I never, never heard a next to my name, unless there was the word, the, the letters SS after it. And so I never, I never heard that. And so, so that was just, that was just me. And so I, when I stepped foot on a college campus, I was like, I was kind of nervous. I was 25 years old, built a company, sold it, built houses, sold them, made, made this money with real estate. And still felt incredibly inadequate. because so I'm like, man, I've never, I've never gotten good grades. I want to, I want to no. stop here and ask you something, if you don't mind, because Please. here you are as a 25 year old, right? You've already seen the power of real estate behind, you know, everything that you've done as as a younger man, yep. and you still decided to take a different adventure. Like you, you've yep. built a duplex that is no small feat. You have to assemble the materials. You got to pull permits. Um, you got to have plans. You got to have probably some other contractor as a consultant help you with yep. this whole giant effort. For and sure. I would assume that probably you did a lot of the swing or ha- the hammer swinging, like you had mentioned. <laughs> Definitely. And yeah, I did. So, you know, you go from this hammer swinging full on real estate type of adventure to now deciding to take a step back at age 25 and head into college. Where was, uh, where was that coming from? So that was, uh, that was for me, it was, you know, uh, I love business. I'm an entrepreneur by trade and by DNA. And, uh, but I also love helping students. So part of being a pastor for me was going in and helping students. And I wanted to continue to be 
be, be, uh, be kind of part of shaping the next generation of great leaders. And uh, so part of it was mission. And the good thing for me is I was pretty much an entrepreneur all throughout college, all throughout, uh, and I never stopped really doing that. And so for me, that shift was, I can always do real estate. I can always do that. Um, it kind of happened at a good time because, you know, a few years later, 2008 visited mm. all the real estate investors. And, uh, so I was 2005, I think when I went to school. And so, uh, so that was, a uh, <laughs> that was good timing, but anyway, um, but yeah, so for me, it was a missional drive and I wanted to go and I wanted to, I wanted to also be a person of impact, not just somebody of, of revenue, not that you can't do that and do both. And I, I, I certainly believe that, but yeah, so for me, it was, it was a missional, uh, uh, issue. I wanted, I wanted to continue to make a difference because at the end of my life, I wanted to be, be responsible for somebody else's life being different. Excellent. Uh, better. Well, I would so. say, um, given your history and what the audience knows about you, that you are very, you're very much a success in that realm as well, uh, by, by, uh, utilizing real estate as a vehicle for helping people. And so let's expand on that a little bit more. So here you are, you know, you, you're in college. Um, what is the next step to get you to real estate or yeah. more specifically commercial real estate? I know yes. it's kind of a jump, but yeah. how did we so, get there? So when I got, so we sold all the real estate to go into to, to school and I, I, I paid cash for a lot of my education. Didn't pay for all of it, uh, but it paid for a lot of it. And um, so when I got out of school, we, uh, we took a job back in, um, I took a job at a church back in Michigan and we bought a duplex and uh house hacked. Right. And so we lived in half and rented the other half out for almost free. I see and a pattern. So, Mike. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we're like, we're like, Hey, we don't want to pay a mortgage. We want a tenant to pay our mortgage. So we did that and it didn't cover all of it. It was a little bit with taxes, insurance and everything. It was like, I think it was actually, I think it did cover it all, but it didn't cover like maintenance and repairs. Mm -hmm. And so we had a little bit of money each month that we'd have to come if something needed to be fixed or whatever, but it was a really good property. We actually still own that property that we bought uh, and that was, that was in 2012. So I took a six to seven year hiatus of real estate, came back in, in 2012. And really, I, I always call this, this is really my, my love for real estate started in my, when I was a teenager, I really became an investor in 2012 when I started building, um, building my, my current portfolio. So 2012, we invested in that duplex, lived in half, rented the other half out. And as we're living there, one of my, my grandpa passed away. And he owned all kinds of properties. And that was his inheritance to the family. So all that went to all the family. But one of my aunts uh, got into some tax trouble and she wanted to liquidate one of her properties. Um, and so, so she asked if, and, uh, if anybody would like to buy it. None of my, my cousins or anybody in the family were in a financial position too. So we came in, we ended up buying that property for $62,000, a duplex. Um, in the welcome to the Midwest, you guys out in San yeah. Francisco don't understand those numbers. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but it's $62,000. We just got that appraised this year and took a home equity line of credit against it. And it appraised for $190,000. Wow. And, and, uh, it, so that was a, that was just that bless That was such a blessing, that investment. <laughs> and so then, uh, and this is where my wife comes in. So we, we get this second duplex. I'm, I'm taking a nap one day. My wife comes and wakes me up. And she's like, Mike, you got to read this book. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And she hands me the, 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 as we call it in the real estate world, the purple book, mm -hmm. which is uh, rich dad, poor dad, which everybody knows that book in real estate. And if you don't, please read it. It's just such a great book. Um, but she's like, I've been reading this. Let's, and so she's, while she's looking, you know, reading rich dad, poor dad, she sits it down, she gets her computer out. She starts searching on Craigslist and finds this little three unit down the road. Now we had had, we had four units at the time, two duplexes. We were living in one of those units. And, um, and, uh, we, we, uh, ended up going and looking at this, this three unit duplex and, uh, the guy wanted to sell it for, uh, as a, um, he, he had it on a land contract or seller financing and he had defaulted on the loan. So what we did is we came in, he, he was a contractor that actually fell off a ladder, broke his back, was tied up, couldn't work. Disability wasn't enough to cover all the payments. And so he just wanted to get out from under the land contract. Now he bought it for 70,000. He had, uh, he had paid it down to 42,000. We went to the sellers and say, we want to take over this loan for mm -hmm. him. And they allowed us to just take over the loan. And so Great. no money down, take over the loan. So we got a project for essentially, they gave us three units for free. Um, and so no money, no money into the deal. So now we have seven and that specific deal, uh, I would say is our most lucrative, small multifamily to date. Uh, that little three unit that she found. You know, um, um, 
Go I got I got to oh, yeah. point out here. I got to point out here. This is because this is gold right here. This is 100% the thing that Sophie and I talk about all the time, which is the power of leveraging your spouse, right? And this is this is just an amazing story to me because here here you are, right? Um, your wife is just now getting inspired by reading Rich Dad Poor Dad, which by the way is a tremendous book. So many many of our listeners out there, if they have not read it, that is an absolute must do. Like literally, once this podcast is over, go to Amazon, go buy it, read it over the weekend, do that right away, because it really is that powerful. And as soon as you get that synergy in there, where you've got husband and wife, or you know partners working together, these types of things just spontaneously happen because now you've got two minds working on one giant uh, endeavor. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, one plus one never really equals two. It actually equals no. 11. So yeah. I think it, I think that is, that is really, really awesome. Um, and very fitting. That is also the best deal that you've got. Yeah. I, I oh, it, and one of the things that I love about um, working as as with, you know, in partnership with Leanne and she's on our website as part of our team. She is part of titanium capital, our investment company. She, yeah. she's, she's ingrained in it because she has a whole different gift set than I do. Um, she's, she's a very strategic and methodical thinker. And, and she, I, I always say, you know, she, I, I, I kind of like my brain doesn't think in details. Hers does. My brain thinks big picture. She thinks big picture too, but I, I, I think big, more big. She is so good at methodically figuring out a way to execute it and, and make sure that we're not making decisions too quickly. Because my greatest skill is my speed, but it's also my greatest weakness. Mm -hmm. um, and it, will, it, it, it has made me more money than any, any skill I have. It's also cost me more money than any skill I have. <laughs> and and, and she's, she's fantastic at saying, okay, but let's think about what about this and this and this. And she brings up things that, I don't think of my brain just doesn't run there. And she's so fantastic at seeing what I can't, um, you know, the, the, the old analogy of warriors fighting back to back is a really good analogy because, mm -hmm. you know, she's fighting okay. to keep things from hitting me and I'm doing the same because we have different gift sets. We see things differently. And that, and to me, that's a great, of course it creates sparks at times that always does in any relationship like that you know, where, where personalities rub on each other, but it, in the majority, uh, you know, it's kind of like, like, it's like, sh you know, the old manual stick shift, you know, when, when you were rolling, you know, you grinded those gears, there's going to be grinding, but sooner or later that gear locks in and you can move. And that, and that's kind of the way that Leanne and I have done our real estate career. And I, I can tell you this, there's no way in the world I'd be where I am today without number one, because she's just not a support system. You know, mm -hmm. half the time she is the system. Mm -hmm. And so, wow. and you know, and I'm the support, you know, or vice versa, you know, and so where I, I I'm kind of get tied up in the, I'm the number, I'm a numbers guy. Like I can run 48,000 numbers off the, she is like, yeah, but, and she thinks way more, she's an empath. She thinks more about people. Well, absolutely. you need both of those in business. I right? think that there's a, yeah, that's absolutely, you need both of those because you do need that high picture view to figure out whether or not you're doing the right things. And yep. then you also need someone who's down in the details doing the right oh, things. Oh, so, so true. Um, and, you know, maybe Sophie, do you have any, any thoughts on this too? Because I, I'm curious about your perspective on whether or not you're seeing some parallels between what Mike and his <laughs> wife has and what we're doing. I'm, I'm trying, I'm fishing for extra credit points right now. <laughs> I'm so the back of Mike, you know. I think <laughs> Mike has earned himself a ton of extra credit points when, when Leanne listens to uh. this podcast. And Mike, you know, again, it's just so refreshing to hear how, you know, how, supportive you are for her and and vice versa and again more than just support but really you, you guys have the synergistic way of moving through life in all aspects right not just mm -hmm. not just financially not just through marriage but in all aspects and and i was curious you know what do you think are like the main pillars for both you and your wife that that are just constant and that you could share with our audience yeah sure sure one of those things is I'm going to, I'm going to use an old word, but it in no way means what most people will import to it. And it's, I call it mutual submission. And here's what I mean by this. I like to submit to her gift set when she's really good at something. I like to just follow her leadership. 
mm-hmm. and vice versa. Mm-hmm. Like for example, she, uh, her, by trade as, as, as uh, you know, you are Sophie, she's a natural health practitioner. So it would be foolish for me to not consult her on my health. That would be foolish. That's, that would be an absolute waste of an amazing talent she has. And for me by trade, because I've done most of it, and I haven't really woven this in, but most of, you know, when I, when I was in, in nonprofit work and went into my uh, business in 2012 as a national speaker, you know, my com- communication for me, speaking for me is the, <laughs> I talk about a, it was the first and only a I ever got in middle school was on a speech. It was one of those things that, you know, whatever you believe, I believe it was implanted in me and it's just something I could do. So for her, when she's giving presentations, it would be, it would be foolish for her to not run her speech, say, Hey, what do you think of this stuff? How, how can I communicate better? Cause that's just, that's, that's my DNA. That's what I do. And so, but for both of us, one of those things is saying, listen, you're really good here. I'm not mm-hmm. and vice versa. And I think that too many, uh, and, and I'll, I'll tell you, it wasn't always that way <laughs> just to encourage couples that aren't experiencing that. Um, there's, I think with two driven people and Leanne and I both are, there can become, even in a marriage, there can become competition. And I think that most people won't talk about that. Like they won't say, yeah, but, but sometimes there's, there's competition for, for that, for, for the glory of the success you're experiencing as a couple. And I know that's weird, but it, it just, it, it is, this is, and I think it's our competitive nature as humans, which is good, but we just have to remember we're on the same team. Right? 100%. Even on what, even on teams though, don't some people war for glory, even on the team, right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes in, in, in a dysfunctional team, that's where that How- team has to, yeah. And how did some of that competition show itself? Yeah, so it, it could show itself in, so let's say we're at a live event back when those kinds of things happened. Uh, let's say we're at a live event and, uh, you know, somebody asks, so what do you guys do? She starts to talk and maybe I talk over her, you know, and I say, yeah, yeah, but the, and, and, and I almost, I talk over because I have a very, dom- just the, who I am, I have a very dominant voice and, you know, I'll just, boom, and, and. And afterwards, she'll bring that up to me, say, you know what, you spoke over me and didn't even realize that I was speaking because I wanted to make sure that I told the story, I told our success, because it almost makes it feel like I architected it as the person I'm speaking to. So that's one way. And mm. speaking for, yeah, so that's, that's one way it comes up. But the other thing is just not, in my opinion, doing things I'm not good at and not consulting and saying, hey, what do you think about this? I mean, I'm mm-hmm. making decisions too quickly without saying, hey, what, what, what are your thoughts here? Because I want to... I want to be able to, you know, find the deal, fund the deal and operate the deal mm-hmm. on my own, which that doesn't, that's, that's n- no good operator ever does those three things on their own. <laughs> yeah. And uh, whether yeah. that's inside of couples or teams or whatever. And so for us, it showed up like, that's one very tangible way that it showed up um, is interrupting each other and that kind of thing. We're in talking over each other, especially in mixed settings. Um, we've been in a lot of mastermind groups and coaching programs and speaking over each other, you know, or me, most of the time, this has been my fault more than hers, um, is speaking over and just acting like I had more to offer when it's, it's interesting. Um, in every group we've ever talked to, people were way more interested in her than me. You know why? <laughs> and I'll, t- I'll, t- I'll tell you why right now. I'll tell you exactly why. And you can probably tell by this podcast because people don't need to know what I'm thinking because I'm, I'm I, I say everything I'm thinking. I talk all the time. Mm-hmm. I talk for a living. Mm-hmm. And she doesn't. She thinks. And she's analytical and she's mm-hmm. methodical and people want to know that. And they, they're always, if people are attracted to me often inside of business settings, it's often because of her. Wow. That, um, that's, and, that's huge. That's huge, man. I, I think that that's just a, yet another thing that, that people and listeners can take away from this is that, you know, even though it may seem, it may seem like um, the, whatever partner in a, a partnership may not seem like they're, being perceived of contributing equally, there's a focus on this particular person because, you know, usually a married couple or, you know, uh, a unit of of two partners, they end up, they end up moving together as a unit. And so Mm -hmm. if one is so outspoken, then the weight that's given to the other person when they do speak is amplified by a lot. And I think that also shows, it translates also not only with words, Mike, but I think also with action too. Totally. Yeah. I I totally agree. When the action is done by someone that is normally uh, in the background or is normally like not visible to the public, then that person ends up like the perception is is that that person really knows that particular subject or knows what they're talking about. Yeah. 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 And I think, I think for me too, what I had to learn in working with a spouse as a, a partner really was that 
that um, I often am placed in because this is this is what I do full time. She runs a business too and mm-hmm. is part of this, but I'm the one day to day often driving things forward. And what I have realized for me is that it's uh, that it was a poor view of what a leader is. So for me, mm-hmm. a leader, you, I mean, uh, Mike of old and the immature side of me that peeks its ugly head out at times is me um, thinking that a leader is the, the, the one forging things forward. And, and I often liken it to a pedestal. A lot of times we think a leader's job that, you know, the, the immature people think leaders are on the pedestal. Um, and the, the growing leaders say, no, you're not the one on the pedestal. You're, you're helping others up on the pedestal. The really refined leaders that are truly good are saying, no, you're not even helping people up on the pedestal. You are the pedestal. Mm. People are standing on your shoulders, effort, service, and thoughts, and everybody else sees them. And, 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 you know, you never walk away from an Olympic, uh, an Olympic ceremony and say, yeah, but that pedestal, nobody ever says that. Right. And so the, the really, really, really seasoned CEOs that just understand how to read the book from good to great. Right. He talks in that book about how the great leaders are often the very quiet, very reserved, very methodical. They're not the one out spouting out things all the time. They're the ones really Really, really, really. And you, you, and you'd walk into a room and they would be the least impressive person in that room. And yet the most impressive leader inside of a confined company. And so that's what I had to realize. I, I had, I had to shift my view what a real partner slash leader was and say, you know what, my, my job is to make sure everybody is on the right, is on the bus, the right people on, uh, on the bus, wrong people off the bus, but then everybody's in the right seats. And, uh, and for me, you know, I wanted to be in every seat and realized that that was the quickest way to crash. <laughs> yeah, 100%. <laughs> yes, especially <laughs> if you're if you're doing the driving and you're also uh, in the back of the bus trying to, that's, you know, trying to like point. sew the sew the seats back together and everything, probably would be better if you let your wife drive and then you oh, sit in the back and, yeah, and do all that, right? Yeah. So, and I think that's good. That's a good reminder too, Derek. There's days yeah. in a good partnership and in a good if if you're working with with a life partner that there's days they will drive and there's days you will drive. Yes. There's days you will be a passenger. There's days they will be a passenger. That's just the influx of good teams. 100%. I think that in, in our relationship, um, at least with Sophie and I, we had to work on, or at least I had to work on something called trust in, because I had the same exact kind of slant that you did, Mike, where I would just steamroll over Sophie's thoughts and words mm. And it wasn't until we started to get coaching, right, to understand that her strength is in what is she isn't saying, is, is what she's not saying. And her wisdom is being centered and calm and not reacting to things that are on the outside. Or, you know, maybe there's, there's another line of thought that she's taking. And really what it came down to for us to work out was the level of trust that I'm, I have to trust her expertise and her knowledge and let things go. Because yeah. just like you, Mike, sometimes I'm a perfectionist. I like to get really, really involved in the weeds and have lots of control over everything. Cause I think that I have the best ideas, but sure. in a relationship where you're, it's a power couple relationship. I'm not going to tiptoe around it. The, the, the three or four of us are all in a power relationship here. Um, and having that trust in your spouse, no matter where you are, is one of the most key things to really, really amping up your business whether you're just starting out and you want to invest passively in multifamily investments, or if you want to start a business up, or if you want to actively work together and try to find single family homes together, or just build a life together, right? So mm. I yeah, think yeah, that's, that's super important. Absolutely. And Mike, I love what you said about, um, I'm, I'm going to, I'm taking notes, submitting to the other's gift set. That's just absolutely brilliant. And and I, I wanted to just... Um, you, you mentioned something earlier on that really stuck out to me because um, it sounds like, I'm mean, gosh, since such a young age, uh, both you and your wife have built this life of, of ongoing success, building upon one success and uh, mm-hmm. on the other. And you did mention that even after going to school, you know, getting your master's, there was still right. that in, inadequacy. Mm-hmm. And I know that a lot of, a lot of our listeners, just a lot of us, we, we may, feel that come up no matter, you know, how much success we've earned. And clearly you have a lot of evidence, you know, backing up, but I'm wondering like um, what, you know, how you manage to navigate through that. Yeah. Feeling. That's a really great question. Holy cow. That's a great question. So I've realized that 
the majority of inadequacy often grows out of the soil of comparison, comparing to people. And so often I feel inadequate when I judge or I lay my, my, I'll call it my interpretation of my success next to my interpretation of somebody else's success. So for example, if I lay my success as a real estate investor next to an investor that has 4,000 units and a couple hundred million dollars portfolio, I'm going to say, man, Mike, what are you really doing? You know, what, you know, you're, you're so inadequate. When if I lay my success next to the rest of the 99 and a half percent of investors, I'm in that top half percent. But because and for me, inadequacy comes from comparing myself to others. And it really comes from, in my opinion, and, I, and I'm, I'm answering your question, how I sh I'm shifting it. And, and I, I feel kind of like a fraud because I don't feel like I have, <laughs> but, I'm, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it this way anyway, um, is I, I feel like number one, when you're comparing to people and, and you know, you're like, I, I lay my success, but it also comes, I think, down to a misdefinition of the word success. So I think a lot of time we think of success as destinational. Like when I make this much money, when I get this job, when I have this many kids or when my family looks like this. And what we often find is when we cross that finish line, we're not satisfied because we, we need that next finish line and that next thing. And what happens is we often success creates the greatest depression because it's not what you thought it would be. Well, so then if it's never a finish line of reaching the goals that we set, what is it? What I realized it is, it's the acceptance of who we truly are. Because if I don't accept who I am, it doesn't matter what I accomplish, I'll still feel inadequate. So it doesn't matter if I make a million a year or $5 million a year or $100 a week, There's I'll still feel, in, I'll, I'll feel inadequate if I don't define success as the acceptance of who Mike was built to be. And, and, and part of that relational, I'll call it ebb and flow of fitting together with my spouse and being able to, to, to move together and, and, and allowing some of that inadequacy to go out, which again, I, I, feel, I feel like a fraud saying that because I feel like I struggle with it daily is, um, is, is saying, you know what, I, I was built to do this. This is who I am. This is, this is what I'm good at. This is what I'm not good at. In fact, I kind of suck at this and that's okay. I think we all suck at some things and we need to own that, you know? And I think that's okay. But I think sometimes that we're in a world where the problem is we've been sold what success should be. Then we've taken that sales, that sales work and applied it to our life. And then we wonder why people are happy. And so for me, that inadequacy came from comparing myself to others and misdefining that it was a finish line. You know, I, I, we, 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 I, we write all of our goals down. We put our goals. I actually have them right here uh, on a brochure every, you know, this was our first year. We did this brochure of our goals for this year and we each have each other's so that I know what my goals are and hers and she has mine and has hers. And we, we go through our goals all the time together. And th that was something we do. But what I realized is all those are simply finished lines, but you know, who crosses all those, even if I get them all is me. And if I don't accept me, none of them will matter. And Man. so I think those inadequacies flow out of the lack of acceptance of who we were built to be. That's just a, that's my, that's my, this thought. is, this is gold. Everyone, this if you guys, if you gold. guys aren't, if you guys aren't getting value out of this, then I'm sorry, but uh, you're not listening. Um, or maybe you don't speak English. That's probably what it is. But uh, Mike, thank you so much. That was beautiful, man. Um, I really, really love that. Uh, and again, you know, the, a couple of things that caught that stood out to me before I want to, I want to start jumping more into the commercial real estate side. And I want to see what you're doing sure. uh, with, with the investing. Uh, but you said, I suck at this, but it's okay. That is something that is so hard for people to be able to separate out, you know, because mm -hmm. usually when we're in a culture right now where other people's positives, the comparison, right. In the social media, looking at everyone else's highlight reel on, on Facebook or, you know, whatever social platform people are on that, that comparison is just like a plague. And then the honesty to be able to say, man, I suck at this. There's two layers. There's the honesty with yourself. And then there's a trust in yourself that you're good at other things. And so that yeah. suckness doesn't equate to the entire you, right? Yeah. Yeah. And no, that's I, hard I agree to differentiate. Completely. Now it is. The other thing I wanted to mention too, that you just subtly mentioned with those brochures. Now, imagine if in a parallel universe, you had that brochure and you did it yourself, but you didn't sit down with your wife. Okay. Mm. How different do you think that would be? Oh man. Yeah, it, it would. So in, so for me, 
Um, I actually think the number one thing that pulls couples apart throughout time is growth at different speed limits. Either one person grows and one doesn't, which is obviously a different speed limit, or they're growing um, in, in, in different directions. But for me, to, to, to know Leanne is to know what's important to her, to know what's valuable to her. And if that's her goal, then how in the world am I going to know her without knowing that and vice versa, her to me? So we actually set these together. We take a retreat in between Christmas and New Year's every year, and we reset our 2000 um, next goals, whatever the next year is. And, um, and so we, we, we take that word and we, that whole week is just nothing but connection, very low media. Uh, we, we get out, you kind of get our heads out of the media and everything and just say, Hey, you know, the, wh- wh- where do we want to go? Cause I think most couples are, are good, great couples have done two things. Well, they've fought well, both with each other. Cause the truth about getting to the next level is battling through the first level. And sometimes that's with each other in some of the, those personality rubs. And other times it's, it's, it's understanding just, this is how you've been wired. This is who you are. This is, I, I, I get to know that. So yeah, if I just set those goals and go forward and she has no idea what's going on in my head and why I'm doing the daily habits I'm doing, and she's not led into that, she's blocked from a big part of me. And yeah, uh, so and- to me, that's why those goals are so important that, that I have hers and she has mine. Exactly. And also it's, it's, if you're sitting there crafting your goals with your significant other, your significant other can have the honesty to point out to you, no, 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 you can do better. Or mm. are you sure you want this? Because if you're, if you're a tunnel vision into your own goals, right, you may not even know what you want. Yeah. But if you yeah. have your significant other behind you and saying, are you sure? Like, this doesn't sound congruent with who you are. If you go in that direction, you set a goal that way. I think you're going to yeah. be miserable. Yeah, Totally. Hundred percent. Yeah. I, I I mean the truth of the matter is I want to eat it in and out every day. And my wife's oh, like, dude. no, that's not that's not a that's not that's not a good that's idea. Not that's not gonna go well for you, right? I mean the truth I mean it's one of the reasons we moved to Phoenix. I'm, dude, I'm kidding. How, do you have bugs in our house, man? Because you must be listening to the same conversations <laughs> that we're saying. Because that's <laughs> that's that, that's me. But but I say that I, I totally agree. I, I agree, Derek. I mean, I think yeah. that I mean you got you and Sophie obviously have an uh, 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 that same idea of saying, Hey, we have to be just the fact you're doing this podcast podcast together, I think is power, man. Mm-hmm. And I think I, I'm glad you guys are doing this because I think there's so many people out there that would love to figure a way to do the life of what matters together, but they can't figure it out. It's like, man, some people are like, man, if we work together all day, we'd kill each other or oh, whatever. Yeah. You know, you've heard those phrases. Yep. My wife works on the other side of that wall and uh, that's her office. And this is mine. And all, all day long. And I, I always say, you know, if, if, if this, if, 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 if there's a such thing as too much time together, we're not doing marriage, right? Yeah. Wow. That's fantastic. That's the way, that's the way I see it anyway. <laughs> that's, that's a, that's a mic drop right there. That's awesome, man. <laughs> yeah. Sophie, what do you, what do you think about all this? Like where, where do you, like what questions do you have at this point? Cause I want to, I want to make the shift over to commercial real estate right now and mm-hmm. how um, spouses go there. But did you want to, did you want to have any any other questions or thoughts for Mike before we move on? Yeah, I, I actually just want to spend a week with you guys <laughs> and just well, shadow we, we you. Need to. Awesome. We well, we want. I, I, I guarantee we learn as much or more from you, you two. This would be a, it. Would be fun. I can tell. I can tell when I met Derek and we got to know each other and talking about him talking about you. I'm like, man, we would we would make a good a good team. It would be really <laughs> fun. Sure. It would be well, fun before- to hang out. Yeah, for sure. And I think before we make the switch, um, because I can, I can ask you these questions, you know, all day long, but I, I, I think, you know, what it, maybe we can kind of for our listeners, even for like the younger couples starting out, mm, because, mm-hmm. you know, um, it's, it's important for them to get maybe, you know, just kind of like a few tangible tips of like, what, you know, is it, a, is it in your morning routine? Or I mean, yeah. you, uh, you talked about the retreat and I think that's incredible that I think that's something that Derek and I will probably start as well. But, yes. when, uh, you know, because you and Leanne started so young, it was mm-hmm. almost like some of the things that you did were a little bit unconscious, um, but that propelled your success. Anyway, I'm curious, you know, when, when you did decide, okay, well, Hey, here's what's been working and this is what we're going to continue moving forward doing what were like the top three, that yeah, you guys yeah. like said, hey, this, a, this is cool. That is a great question. Um, so I would say 
um, it took us a long time to, to find, I will call it marital rhythm mm -hmm. of just like, we're, we're just in flow. And, and again, anytime we're in too much flow, we're like, okay, we need to push ourselves a little harder because there, there needs to be sparks to be, to be flame. Right. And so, um, but I, I would say we, we, it took us a while. I mean, we, we, it took us, through, I would call it almost through our entire twenties to figure out like, oh, this is who you are. This is how, but I would say that the couple things that, that I would say young couples, especially if I would have started this when I was 21 with Leanne and we would have started or, or her with me, both of us, this would have changed everything. It would have been first do some sort of personal development together around something, go to a communication class together, go to a, a, you know, a, a, a relationship retreat, go to a business class together, go to anything, but do something, try to do your life together. Like there's a couple, there's one, um, I've pretty much gotten rid of most of the hobbies we can't do together. Now I still play golf. I'm a golfer and she is uh, not, but I, I leverage that for business. So if I am away, I'm, 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 I'm pushing our business forward, but, but I'm, I'm a golfer and I do go backpacking with my dad a couple times a year. And so, um, th those are a couple things I do, but I, do, I try to eradicate as much that we can't do together. But that being said, one thing is just start growing together somehow, go to something that you're working on together. That's one thing I wish I would have started in my early, early, early twenties, um, is that we were doing something together. So that it was just like part of that duplex that actually was almost really much more than a house was on the weekends we were there. She was moving lumber around with us. She'd go and she, she'd grab lunch for all of our construction guys. She was part of that. It wasn't like, you know, build the house and let me know when it's done. It was both of us figuring, figuring this out. Cause I had never built a house from scratch. I'd done a lot of building, but never pulled all the permits. Myself. So I'm learning as I'm going, making all kinds of errors and mistakes. And, um, you know, and, and so, so I would say work on some sort of personal development together. The second thing is I, I, I always say like, do this separately. And then to, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, think about this separately, but then do it together, create some sort of architected plan fast forward five years, do this together. And even, you know, you can even bring in a facilitator that's good at facilitating something like this in five years. What would you like your, your, your life to look like in three categories, finances, your relationships, and your health. Um, I, I think those are the big three of health, wealth, and relationships that, because that, that's where those are the three things that, that visits most of our lives. Like without health, you don't have much, you know, without, with, if you're always trying to, you know, scrounge together enough money to pay the bills. There's just so much stress on the relationship. In fact, that's one of the number one drivers of marital separation is money. Yep. And, um, and then of course the relationship, what do you want that to look like? I mean, where do you, where do you want to live as a couple? What do you want to be doing? Where do you, what, what levels do you want to get to? Um, and so, so I would say a couple things like that is some personal development, personal development together and some doing some architecture together, architecting what that next few years is going to look like. I will clarify too that, and, and man, this is, this is gold, you guys, this is awesome. This is fantastic for our listeners. Many people may not even be aware that they could be doing some of these things together, mm. right? Because a lot so of true. people and a lot of marriages are on autopilot. And that's why we've did this podcast. And that's why we're so passionate about building passive income for couples together with a shared vision. So, so that awesome. you can retire together because if only one person is building passive income and the other person doesn't understand that vision, then what vision are you building towards? It will be a vision with just yours, right? And yeah, the other person exactly. isn't even there. And so you have exactly. all the spare time from passive income, but no one to share it with or no exactly. one that agreed with you. So, um, so I, think that that's, I think that's really, really important. And that's, that's a killer tip, man. Thank you so oh, much. Yeah. Amazing, Mike. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Sophie, for that question. Because this is helping me dig into a little bit of, you know, sometimes we ignore the fundamentals. You know, I mean, that, they always say that with basketball teams that are, that are losing, they say, let's go back to the what? The fundamentals, fundamentals. And sometimes these conversations help remind me of, man, go back. These are some things we should be doing today. And so it's these fun, th these things, you, you never grow out of these. You watch married couples that are holding hands when they're 80 it's because they're still doing this kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, it, and I'm telling you, but, uh, but no, this is, this is fantastic. I'm truly enjoying this because Absolutely. it's uh, such a part of our lives. Likewise. And I think yes. all three of us, and I'm sure if Leanne was here with us, yeah. and she will, we'll have to time. get her on someday. Oh, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah.
All right, well, let's make the switch and let's go into commercial real estate because ultimately this is also a real estate investing show as well. And so uh, marriage is a huge part of this, but we also want to talk about what's new and how did you get into commercial real estate and walk us through where you are from where you left off. You know, left last, last we left off, you had your aunt had given you or they had sold a property to you, left yep. a property to you that just recently appraised for more than $120,000 more than you bought it from five, six right. years ago, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, so yeah. That, that's where we were. Now we're up to, what is it, seven units, you said? Se- right? Yeah, we have seven units. And so we're continually to accumulate. All this is in Southwest Michigan. And so we continue to accumulate and accumulate and accumulate. And so uh, my wife had a, uh, she, she had a naturopathic practice in, uh, in one of our duplexes, um, and she got a she got a message one day. She was operating, and it was all legal and everything. But she got an operate a, a letter one day from the county saying your sign is too big. And then they started doing some digging and realized that that specific zoning of where that was was not conducive to practice. It oh, needed to move. So, so we had to start looking for a new place that that would would hold her practice. So we bought this. Uh, she actually found a co-op space that she could operate out of for a time, and then we bought this little single-family home in a com- in a commercial area. Ran her office out of there um, until she grew kind of a, a grew out of that, and then we bought a commercial duplex. Um, and we rent one side was rented to a dentist. We renovated the other side, and she still operates out of that today. It's a beautiful property. Um, in Southwest Michigan. And so we, we, we took that little house that she was her office, turned it back into a rental. And now we rent that out. So I think that we, we had, we have currently, we have 15 uh, units in Southwest Michigan. Well, then I met a, and this is the power of real estate, right? I met a person in Indiana, got to know him real well. And uh, his dad was retiring and had a 23 unit portfolio that he wanted to sell. And uh, he wanted, he actually, he was going to in- give it to his son. His son was going to inherit it but it wasn't stable. His son was a fl- fix and flipper. He did fixes and flips and never had any real rentals. So he didn't, he's like, I don't really know. And the property wasn't stabilized. It was net and like 23 units was net and like 10 grand a year. It was an awful mm-hmm. portfolio. Yeah, but, uh, but, uh, but the, so the son's like, I don't know that I really want it. So he came to me and, uh, and we ended up buying that portfolio from him but it was on a, they, they, he was an older gentleman. He wanted a, a land contract, which that's what we wanted to sell our financing, yep. but no money down. So we just gave us 23 properties under a contract. And so, so we got 23 properties under a contract and uh, that specific portfolio it hit it or that per specific sale hit my, and, and all of a sudden I saw the economy of scale open up my eyes yeah. and the economy of scale means, you know, a single family home and you own a single family home, which by the way, I'm not saying don't own, own single family homes for rentals. They're, they're very powerful investments. But when the tenant moves out of a single family home, you have zero revenue. In a multifamily home, when somebody moves out, you still have people living there. And then I, then, so as we, as I invested in this, the economy scale, all these units, I'm like, wow, when I stabilize this, this is going to be a really, really solid portfolio. So then I hired a property manager in that area. And then I started saying, okay, you know what? I want to go five units and above into the commercial space for three reasons. One was because of uh, this thing called forced appreciation. Banks see commercial real estate as a business more than a piece of real estate. So they, 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 they determine its value based on its income. Meaning if you can increase the income or decrease the expenses, increasing your net income on the property, you increase the value. So you can actually control the speed limit of appreciation. So I thought, I like that. The second thing is banks, because they see it as a business, lending is actually easier on a commercial building. Um, And so they don't see you as much as a liability because they have a business tied to the property and not just block studs and drywall. And so that was one reason. The second reason was, again, that economy of scale and I could leverage. We've always told leveraging other people's money is one of the most powerful ways to generate wealth. And we always talk a lot of times, I had heard that in the bank realm. I hadn't heard that really in the private money realm. And then all of a sudden I'm like, well, if I can leverage bank money for some of it and private money for the rest of it, I can keep a piece of equity and have no money into the deal and that's a powerful way to build wealth because there's no limit to the amount of times I can do that. So at that point, I'm like, I start talking to Leanne and, I'm, and, and she's like, yeah, I, I think that's a good idea. That makes all make sense. Let's start looking. So I started Googling for a mentor because I, I didn't know how to get into real commercial real estate. I didn't really know how to, um, 
how to, uh, to, to, to what there's a word called syndication. If you've never heard that word, it's just a way to structure a deal that, that, that breaks off the, the level of partnership from limited to general. And so I, I didn't know any of this. I heard, I was hearing word syndication and SEC and 503B funds. And I'm like, what in the world? This sounds like, this sounds like the worst thing ever to learn all this stuff. I'm like, I need, I need a mentor. <laughs> yeah. So I just, I just went to Google. I'm like syndication mentor. I literally, that's what I typed in. And up came a bunch of people and I started clicking through them. And this man named Vinny Chopra came up and I, I emailed his team and got on the phone with one of his assistants and uh, ended up joining Vinny's, uh, Vinny's group. And, and that's Derek where you and I met. Yeah. And, uh, and then right after that 70 days uh, for 71 days from the day I signed up, we put our first commercial real estate deal under contract. And then, our second deal to uh, about five weeks later under contract. And we're about to put our third under contract. And because of Vinny's coaching, by the way, that's, that's just a side note. That's why everybody needs a coach. Um, every, everybody needs a coach. I don't care what, it, what, whether you're talking about marriage or you're talking about re commercial real estate, 100%. everybody mm -hmm. needs a coach. I, I, I caught this idea. I was listening to a YouTube video of Michael Jordan one time and whether you're a basketball fan, a lot, fan or not, Michael Jordan's one of the greatest basketball players that's ever lived. And he told the story one time of, you know, he says, you know, do you think I need a coach? And a lot of people are like, well, you're the greatest basketball player ever. And he, his whole point was when I'm dribbling the, the, the ball down the court, Phil Jackson, which was his coach on the Bull, uh, Chicago Bulls at the time, he said he could see things that I couldn't see. For example, when I'm dribbling, he would say things like, Michael, every time when you dribble right, you take a left step first. The defense is picking up on that and they know where you're headed. Mm -hmm. You've got to just go on your right foot first. And they would tell him, he said he could see things that my mind just subconsciously did. And then he said, do you think I could take Phil Jackson one-on-one? -on -one? Yeah, I can take him one-on-one. -on -one, I guarantee that, but I need a coach. And, he's a, and I'm like, here's the greatest basketball player on the planet, arguably of all time, saying he needs a coach. I probably need a coach then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 100%. So, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, man, I'm, I'm, I'm so jiving with you right now because there are, while the free tools that are out there to mm. uh, get started and anything is out there because of the internet, totally. there's, yep. the, and, and there's a whole bunch of information. I think it's there just to help you get to the point where you then need a mentor. And I think that is a great point. I would That's say- Such a good point. I would say that probably um, without mentors, like- I, here, let me, let me back up to say this. I think that the mentors in your life that you have right now signifies what is important to you. Mm, if you don't have, point. if you don't have a mentor in real estate investing, um, or you're not looking to someone or actively talking with someone that you can, that's, that's ahead of you, then I would say almost that you're not serious mm, mm -hmm. because you cannot, you cannot build this all yourself. It's you, it, it, you've got to step out of the, the ego trap of saying, Oh, you know, I'm going to do everything myself. This so goes true. all the way back to trusting your spouse, right. And working in a team because together you'll be able to go so much further. And with the right guidance, like you said, the beautiful analogy with Michael Jordan, 100%. I'm sure that uh, even Barack Obama, I know for a fact that he and George Bush and Clinton and everyone before him brought in Tony Robbins. Yeah, exactly. They brought in coaches from time to time. They and they're the most powerful yeah. people in the, in, on the planet, right? Yeah, you got so it. You, I, I am 100% with you on that. So, okay, so yeah. now we're at Vinny right now, right? So we've, yeah. we're, we're in Vinny's mastermind. We're working together. Um, it's, an interesting it's an interesting climate right now to try to buy property, but you've got one under contract. Where, what markets are you looking at? And um, you know, what, what types of properties are you looking for? What's your, what's your specific... Uh, yeah. So there. right now I'm, I'm, I'm investing a little, little counterintuitively. So what I'm seeing is I'm seeing where people are drawing back. And I think that's a good area to lean into. Mm. And here's why, for example, this is a sad reality, but due to the shut, the, the, the 2020 shutdown and what's looking like we're going to see again in the United States, we're going to see a myriad of restaurants, bars, all close, right? I think the middle of next year, or maybe the beginning of this next year is going to be the perfect time to start a restaurant because you're going to have less competition and you're going to be moving into, you're going to be able to get buildings and all the materials for pennies on the dollar. Can you also imagine the pent up demand between exactly. the people that have been stuck inside? Bingo. Like exactly. Same thing so, with travel. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I think that's a, so, so how does that translate to real estate? I see a lot of people because of colleges, for example, going online 
and that kind of thing. So I think I see a misinterpretation. So people are saying like, so don't buy student housing, for example. And I'm like, I would agree in certain markets. But if you lean into markets that you know the school has a rich tradition of live experience and that'll never go online, I think that's a good place to lean into because people look at other markets and translate those to those markets. For example, I invest a lot into, in those Indiana properties in South Bend because South Bend's a really, really solid market right now. And uh, right around Notre Dame, I'm investing in, in student housing because I'm getting it at a really, really, really good rate and we're making good money because even though they're going online, Students are moving to just to be next to the campus because it's an, it, it, you don't, you don't take Notre you don't get into Notre Dame to do it from your living room. That's right. And so, so that's one, one market I'm investing heavily in from a, from, from a bigger deal. Now I wouldn't invest in a, like 150 unit deal there. The smaller deals I really like in that zero to 50 unit deal there. I really like, I say zero, that'd be nothing five to 50 unit deal. Uh, but the markets I really love are, Let's just call it Charlotte, Atlanta, Nashville, Dallas, Houston. Yep. Um, San Antonio is a powerful market because San Antonio's it, it, it's it, it, it's no longer an emerging market; it's an emerged market. But that's a really powerful market. Phoenix, I, so I live in Phoenix. Phoenix is a beautiful market. Yep. But when I look at markets, I really look at three things: job growth, pop growth, and landlord friendly. Mm -hmm. That's really the three things I look for job and pop population growth. A lot of people are like, well, aren't those the same thing? You can see actually population growth in retirement communities where job growth isn't increasing. So you want to make sure that those two are both increasing. And then I like to look at landlord friendly because especially when pandemics are around, you can have tenants living in there for a year or more and never pay you any rent. It can really, it can really just tank your entire system. Uh, you, you, if you're investing on either coast right now in the Northeast or Southwest on those coasts, or actually the whole Western coast and Northeast, you know, Boston, New York city, some of those cities that are really, really tenant friendly. You're going to be, a, you're going to have a really hard, hard time. While you might find some good deals in those, mm -hmm. those, um, those upcoming markets, because the truth of the matter is, as much as I love multifamily, we're starting to see the wear of the pandemic on multifamily, it, but it's in those big city markets because people are moving away from those because they're, whether it's because they're scared of COVID and they don't want to be around so many people, or whether it's because they want to lower their living expenses or whatever it is, it's happening. The, the, one mentor said the why isn't important, the what's more and um, uh, on stuff like that. And so, so I think the wear of those bigger city markets, I think that's why we see a lot of move to Southeast, low taxes, mm -hmm. low cost of living, landlord friendly. I mean, we see a lot of that stuff and that's why I think those markets. So I love Texas, Southeast, Tennessee is a great market. Um, all the big cities in Tennessee, Nashville, Chattanooga, um, Jacksonville, even Memphis is a great market um, if yeah. you can find a good, good property in there. So, so a lot of those markets. And then, then there's the Midwest. The Midwest is the sleeping giant. It's the giant where people can, can get into for less money per door. And historically, it's been the safer play for cash flow, but not as strong for appreciation. That's changing because so many people know that. Because what creates appreciation? Demand. Yeah. And when so many people are moving in to invest in it, it spikes that demand. And so because we've seen more investors come to Indiana, Columbus, Cincinnati, I'm sorry, uh, Indianapolis, Columbus, Cincinnati, uh, South Bend, uh, you know, those, those Midwestern markets there, uh, excluding Chicago, because Chicago is another one of those big cities mm -hmm. that's been significantly affected, anything in Illinois. Um, those, those Midwestern cities, we're seeing those appreciation numbers because that demand is, is on the rise heavily. That's right. And, and so, it's, so it's, that's why I like those markets. Absolutely. And it's forcing investors like us to be more creative. A lot of totally. things that, a lot of things that, you know, one thing that, that uh, stuck out to me, a strategy that you were looking at was um, doing some uh, office conversion to multifamily. That's another creative way uh, to target a market. So if you like the market fundamentals, but maybe the asset type isn't right, a little bit of out of the box thinking to do office conversions into multifamily, since a lot of the infrastructure is pretty much the same. You have yep. an HVAC system, you have, you know, uh, windows, Plumbing. you have doors, framing. Yeah. You've got all of that. In some cases, elevators, which may even be a, um, you know, a that, perk. that might be a perk. That might be a really yeah. nice thing to have. Uh, I think just getting around the zoning and watching cities and jurisdictions that are more, uh, more lax in allowing that to happen, as long as that commercial property, the office space 
is in a place that's near other residential areas, I think it's a really good, good area to watch. But I love that you're absolutely following all of where the migration data is pointing to, where people are moving from, moving out of Cal California, out of New York, uh, some, some, some of the big, big metros and consolidating to getting bigger space, either if yep. that's a rental unit or buying a house in some yep. of these markets where it's cheaper and there's more room because, hey man, right now I'm talking to you in my Zoom room. Sophie has her own Zoom room. You've got yep. yours. <laughs> and that's, that's a luxury that people really want to have in a Definitely. pandemic, right? So yeah, no, a absolutely. Yeah. And that office conversion idea you just mentioned, we're, we're, we just, you know, I just got a construction quote today on one of them that we're looking to put an offer in on. And the, 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 the dance for doing some of that is, you know, you take your construction cost and you have to get your cost of the building down enough to make that number work a matter because right now construction cost is, oh my word, expensive. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of, of the shortage of labor, because 2008, 2009, uh, with, when all the work went away, a lot of those contractors went to different industries. Yeah. Um, and so we lost a lot of our supply of contractors and we've never really recovered. Yeah. We are recovering because schools are starting to push the trades a little more. We're starting to see a recovery on that. Yeah. But so even those method out methodologies take some finessing. And that's what I've learned a lot from Vinny and, and being around people like you and being around other people that are in the real estate game, thinking of things just a little different. You know what I mean? 100%. That's great. Wow. Fantastic. Um, Sophie, did you want to add anything? Do you have any questions about, you know, uh, from your perspective, uh, what Mike is seeing and, and his strategies in selecting property to invest in? Yeah. So um, I know you mentioned um, Midwest being a sleeping giant. <laughs> and do you think it's still, uh, you know, you said that next year might be a good time. Middle next year might be a good time to like get back into the game. Yeah. How, how about, you know, for the people who have cash to de deploy and they yeah. just, they're itching to do something with their cash, like what, you know, what areas of the country or what, what would you recommend to those yeah. people who are just like, they're itching? Yeah. So, so, so here's a, th it, it depends. <laughs> That's a really good question. So if somebody has capital and they're like, man, I, I want to get it into something, I would say this, be very careful in in being too hasty right now, even even if you're o even if you're overcapitalized or you've sold a building. Now, if you're in the middle of like a, in the United States in a 1031 and you've got to move money, different ballgame. Then you have to be a little bit more aggressive on what you're looking for, and you might have to take a little bit less return just to park the money. But um, but if 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 you have capital to deploy, the first thing I would say is just be patient. The mm -hmm. second thing I would say is the best way to deploy capital in an inventory short market is to not look for deals, but rather create deals. Mm -hmm. And so if I was, if I had a bunch of capital and no deals on my plate, I would get a list of apartment building owners in a market I was interested in. And I'd start calling them and asking them to meet. If we could find a number that fit both of us, would you be interested in selling? And, 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 you know, make sure that it's a win-win. You're not going to go in you know, especially right now, you're not going to go get anybody to go under a fire sale. It's just not going to happen. Um, especially with enough government money coming into the economy, people can pay their bills and pay rent. That's why we haven't seen the big rents dive. We thought we would. And so with all of that, people aren't seeing terrible numbers and just have to get rid of their buildings. That's not happening. Mm -hmm. Now, will it happen next year? I don't know. We'll see. But, um, but that being said, I would, I would start looking a little bit more creative off-market strategies, some direct mail to property, to, to, to multifamily owners. So if I had property to, to boy, the other thing I would look for is there are some really successful syndicators doing a little bit different things. There's some mobile home park movements, some senior living investing, some things that are, I wouldn't invest in like hotels or anything like that. But, I, but some of those different kinds of investing that are still built on necessity you know, because, uh, you know, the, one of the, the, the number one thing that goes away in uh, economy retracting markets is luxury, right? So luxury investing, you know, investing in, you know, you know RV industry, it'd be a bad investment right now, that kind of thing. But, but it, so, so if you have capital, partner with a syndicator that's on that, just the hunt for deals. Because, um, you know, we, like, for example, I'm looking at two off-market deals nobody knows for, that are for sale right now. I called my broker. It was in Dallas. On, uh, and I said, what do you have? He says, you know what? I have a guy that owns three buildings. Let me call him, see if he'd be interested in selling one. He calls him up. 
he is interested you and he, and the numbers look great. So he calls me, we get on the phone. It's that kind of stuff that, that is really important to do right now, instead of just surfing loop net, acting like you're going to find a really good deal off there. Cause I'm just going to tell you, you're not, <laughs> if you do pull the trigger, but, but if you find a really good deal on loop net, I'd have about 7 trillion questions before I pulled the trigger on that. 100%. And, and you're <laughs> you know? also going to have um, 40 other people that are competing against you as well. Exactly. So exactly. That's, that's the thing. And, and, and these brokerages that have off-market deals, but they have a mailing list of investors like Derek and I and us for, for like you two and like Leanne and I for, that's a mile long and that off market deal gets sent to 5,000 investors. It's yeah. not really off market. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's on just not market. on loop net. That's all. Exactly. That's all it's just not means. on the, on the actual uh, yeah. internet for people to and see. So, that's exactly right. Again, it always comes right back down to relationships, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. That's, that's great. You know, because you oh. know, the relationship you have with your wife that helps amplify your operations to achieve more and buy more totally. property. And then your relationships so with brokers helps expand your network to obtain property. So um, again, you know, real estate investing in any business really is a people-based business because you're searching for that, that demand, what it is that yeah. people want. Totally. Um, one totally. other thing that I was going to add to onto that in terms of what to look for, if you have a whole bunch of cash and you notice too, Mike, how Sophie, when she always asks a question, it's always a fantastic question. Whereas I'm just <laughs> yeah, kind she's of a like, thinker. You know, she's taking kind of notes. They're very crafty. Yeah. yeah. I know, I'm, I know. I'm, I'm being I'm, a little selfish right now. I'm, I'm like... <laughs> Well, no, I, I'm the kind of person on a podcast. I'm like, what's that book on your bookshelf? You know, I mean, and my wife's like, she's more strategizing. I totally, I get it. I totally get it. So, but one thing, one thing I wanted to add on to um, what, what your, your techniques, which were fantastic. That was also gold for people. I would back up and say, make sure that you do your research and get a mentor because some of these creative strategies will take time to develop. And so definitely, uh, you've got, definitely. you've got to plan in time and be patient because you cannot get all of this knowledge and all these relationships from day one. It just doesn't know that doesn't happen consistently. And I will also say to Sophie's question of what to do if you're deploying capital, I'll actually speak to the operators for a minute. If you know people ready to deploy capital, what I think this time has taught me the most is you can't be lazy. Like I think over the last five to seven years as multifamily investors, it's trained us to get a little lazy. You know, it's it, it, we've been plenty deals. Money's been very easy to raise over the last, you know, you know, since let's call it two fourteen on two thousand fourteen on. You know, it's been you know a lot of money, and we've gotten a little lazy, I think. And so now we're like, oh, there's no deals. Yeah, well, exactly. remember back when we had to create them, yeah, and we had to actually create be business and marketing people to get deals, not just stumble on the internet and buy a deal. And I think it's it's trained a little laziness in us. And so I think what's going to happen. Um, What's going to happen is we're going to see a lot of operators that aren't willing to put in the work go by the wayside. And, um, and the ones that are willing to be a little bit of a workhorse and say, you know what, investors, here's the five deals I underwrote this week. And I, gear, I am going to find us a deal that makes sense for your money. Just hang tight. I'm working every single day to get you a deal. It, we need to, I mean, if I can just speak bluntly, we need to up our game. Yeah, absolutely. And I know for a fact that people out there who are looking to park their money are not going to be able to outwork you. So I definitely encourage people uh, to reach out to Mike for sure, because he's got uh, fantastic strategies. He's just dropped a whole bunch of gold on us. Um, and I just, I can't thank you enough for being here, man. This is, a, this has been fantastic. Oh, uh, it's been so much fun. Um, this conversation has been truly enriching absolutely um, to, to have mm -hmm. with you guys you guys are both amazing uh people and so i'm so thankful to i, I have feeling where this is the start of an amazing long-term friendship it is uh, absolutely 100 percent. now i do want to ask we have five questions that we like to ask everyone that's sure. kind of asked in in quick order it's called our rapid round in, all right it's it's and it's um you know it's meant to kind of give us a little bit more of a sneak peek into what you do so uh, whatever you can just answer this the the questions um, as succinctly as you can, um, yep. and, uh, and just let us, let us know what your, what your, uh, opinions are on these. So the first Bring question it. is what book has had the biggest impact on you and why? I'm actually going to have to go with, um, oh my goodness. Uh, I'm going to have to go with, I, I'm gonna have to go with a, a weird book for maybe some people, maybe not so weird for other, 
Um, the Bible's actually had the biggest impact on me because I think it teaches the golden rule, which says, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And I think if we would go back to that, everything we've talked about, I don't care if you're in marriage, if you treat people how you want to be treated, things will win. If you're, if, if you're an operator and you treat your investors how you'd want to be treated if you were a passive investor, you watch your business grow. You want to watch your relationship grow, do the same thing. And it's one of the greatest principles I've ever learned that really guides my thinking because I think you know what? I, I, if I continue to live on how I treat Derek and Sophie is how I would want to be treated if I was on the other end of that. I think it drives, it would, it would make the, the political upheaval and all the problems in the world, a lot of them remove if we were thinking about the reception of what we do and our actions. 100%. Fantastic, man. Great answer. Number two, if people wanted to be just like you, what oh, is boy. the first actionable thing <laughs> that they could do to follow in your footsteps? <laughs> Run like crazy. <laughs> you, know, you know, I will say this. I will say this. The one thing that, um, that I, I think that is maybe had some sort of ingredient to where I am is the ready, aim, fire mentality. Mm. And while I've mentioned that has been my greatest weakness, the, the strength in that is I've been able to shoot, you know, four bullets at the target before other people have had their gun loaded. And so, so I can, I can re reorient. And so I think a lot of us is we're, we're waiting for that perfect property. We're waiting until somebody just comes and says, I want to give you money instead of going out and asking people to invest mm -hmm. with us. We're, we're waiting. And I feel like the, the action, you know, whatever you think you need to do to get it done times it by 10, the old Grant Cardone method. Uh, but the whole point is, I think that action is, is, is incredibly important to say, you know what, I'm going to do this before I'm ready. And I'm going to learn as I go. If I trip, I, that's how you learn. I think so many people want to perfect it before they do it. And that's not possible. Beautiful. Beautiful. I cannot agree with you more there. This is great. All right. Number three, what do most people not know about you? What they don't know about me. What most people don't know about me is I am in, I was diagnosed with ADHD and was on medication until I was in ninth grade and graduated with a 1.9 GPA. As I mentioned here, mm -hmm. they, they don't know that I was a kid that had the kind of energy that was too much for most scenarios. And what I realized was that energy is later what separates me. And, uh, and, and so I, I, I used to hate what today I love, but I will say that only to say what most people don't know is, you know, people tried to, to, I, I was, I was, I'm as ADD as it comes as the textbook definition. And so if you think you're out there and you're thinking I'm all over the place, there's no way I can focus and move forward. Um, contrary. <laughs> yeah. I would say that your, your energy is very, is focused very, very strongly into a certain, into certain directions. And I think that that is a, is very much one of your strengths. So that's awesome. Okay. Number four, how do you like to unwind and restore your creative juices? Uh, my, so if, since my wife moved into our, uh, first, um, that, that duplex, we started taking, uh, in the evening started taking long walks, like in the one to two hour range. And those debrief of the day, dr talking, dreaming, working through issues, you know, whatever, that's been one of the biggest, in fact, right after I get off this podcast, we're going to go for a walk. But um, the, that's been one of the, the biggest re rejuvenators, you know, I'm not saying that I don't like to sit down and binge watch the office like the next guy. Yeah. Um, but I think that's been the most truly rejuvenational and gets my creative juices flowing is, is bouncing things off Leanne and us being out on a walk. I would say that's my, my the greatest way I re recoup. Fantastic. I know that Sophie and I, we did that uh, and we need to get back into that habit actually, because recently um, because it's been getting dark and a little bit colder, yeah, it's just sure. not an excuse. You know, we need, yeah. to be, we need to be out there talking and, and getting the blood flowing. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, it's, it's huge. All right. And the very last question that I have is something that you may have already answered, but maybe you've got another one for us. Is there something special that you and your spouse like to do together? That we love to do together. My, my wife and I actually love to uh, ma mastermind together. 
Mm-hmm. Um, we love to, I love when she brings her business to me and says, okay, I want to, I want to, you know, increased, I, I want to increase the value of a customer and decrease the cost of acquisition. Like that kind of stuff is fun for us. Like, and, uh, and, you know, and so for, we love to work on each other's businesses together, even because even though she's involved and I'm involved in hers, we have our separate businesses and we love to, to mastermind together. That's one of those things we love together. We love to hike. Absolutely love, love, love the outdoors. One of the reasons we love Phoenix is there's tons of hiking and beautiful out, outdoors to experience together. And so, yeah, so we, we love to do that. That's amazing. Well, Mike, thank you so much for being on. This has been such a pleasure. The honor and the, uh, the pleasure has been all on our side because you're such an inspiration to us and to so many couples out there, I'm sure. Thank you so much for coming on to Elevate Your Equity and sharing your wisdom and advice with us. We really yes. appreciate that. Thank you so much, Mike. And I can't wait for part two with Leanne. Yeah, I can't wait. I, I would love to do that because she is, uh, she's such a, she's so much, uh, She's so much more of a thinker on on diff- different level than I am. And so you would benefit uh, from her mind probably three times as much as mine. <laughs> We'd have to get her on. That would be that would be so much fun. And even if even after uh, that, we we all need to just uh, connect sometime and just just uh, hang out. All right. Absolutely. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Mike. It's been a pleasure having you on board. And uh, this is Derek Clifford and Sophie Lauren Clifford. We're signing off. Take care, guys. Have a good one. Bye.